off this next session, uh, Ancestral Health for Women, uh, we have our two speakers, Sarah Ballantyne and Stacy Toth. Um, some exciting news, Sarah Ballantyne is, as of a few days ago, now a New York Times bestselling author. And Stacy Toth, also very cool, she just qualified for Strong Woman Nationals. That's very cool as well. So I will let them take it away. Thank you. Right, St Stacy's gonna, whoa, it's not even on. Can you guys hear me? Oh, there we go. Stacy, do you wanna introduce Are you the working yet? I, I gotta take a picture of everybody. All right. Um, pretend Stacy's saying something really awesome, everybody. I, well, everything I say is awesome, so. Um, um, you guys can pretend that it's the end of our talk and you're giving us this huge standing ovation. <laughs> no, no, a huge standing ovation. Listen, it's gonna be great. Everybody wants to stand. De you know, wait, sitting is death. Come on, huge standing ovation. There you go. Oh, there we go, we got it. You're not corny at all. No, but that's going on Instagram later. Okay, so Sarah has done almost all of this. I'm just gonna break it down into layman speak for most of us, um, or maybe not most of us, maybe most of you get it, I don't. So um, she's gonna go into what the HPA, HPT and HPG accesses are, and what our recommendations are because of those accesses within specifically women's bodies is what the talk is today. Hey, um, so I think most of you are probably familiar with who we are. Um, we both used to be unhealthy. We both found paleo. We both got healthy. I'm a scientist. Woo -woo. And that's about it, right? Yep. Okay, that's good. She does science. I do strong. It's not that I'm weak. <laughs> it's not that I'm not smart. Okay. So um, Sarah did this awesome little uh, evaluation fixing of the primal man here to be a primal woman. Um, because every single diagram showing the evolution of man shows man and not woman, and today's about women's health. And similarly, almost all medical research studies are done on men. So um, what we're gonna talk about is specific to women and what we found in that research, but typically all of the research on this type of um, effects of hormones and all these sort of things are done on men. So we're just trying to remind you and bring home the message that we're, we're looking at it from the perspective of women's health and how it affects women's hormones today. So the, there are many different hormone systems in the body. What we're really going to be talking about today are three different systems and how they're interlinked. So we're going to be talking about thyroid, we're going to be talking about adrenals, we're talking about ovaries and how those things interact with each other and how those things interact with our environment. And by environment, you know, specifically today, we're going to be talking about diet. So the hormone systems in the body are controlled by the brain. Um, and specifically, they're controlled by the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is like hormone control in the brain. It actually receives signals from a different part of the brain called the hippocampus. The hippocampus is the part of the brain that takes information from the senses and kind of assembles it and figures out what's going on. It makes decisions. So let's say you're falling off a cliff. Like, that's not a good thing to do, so don't go out and purposely fall off a cliff. But if that was a bad thing that happened to you, your hippocampus would ha you know, be receiving these signals of, hey, there's no ground beneath me and I'm holding on by an arm and this is bad and I should do something. It sends signals to the hypothalamus, which then goes, aha, we're stressed, fight or flight response time. And the hypothalamus then sends a specific signal to the pituitary gland, which then sends a specific signal to the um, adrenal glands. Well, this works in not just the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, which I'll talk more about in a second, but it works for all hormonal axes. There is a brain control, and so there's a control of the hormones that really comes from the senses of our environment. So I talked a lot about the HPA axis yesterday. To remind you, this is the, the fight or flight response in the, in the human body, but it also has very important normal roles in the human body. It's a uh, cortisol circadian rhythm hormone. Um, it's a metabolism hormone. Um, and so it's not just fight or flight, it's also how this axis is activated and deactivated throughout the day. 
So the hypothalamus gets the signal from the hippocampus, it's time to be stressed. Um, it releases a hormone called corticotropin releasing hormone, or CRH, which sends the signal to the pituitary gland that we're doing stress response now. The pituitary gland releases another hormone called adrenocorticotropin hormone, or ACTH, which sends a signal to the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands then go, aha, okay, we're doing stress response now, and they secrete all the things that the adrenal glands secrete, um, including cortisol, including catecholamines like adrenaline. Now, what's really important about these axes is it's not just one way. So the brain needs some way of knowing that the, the target endocrine organ received the signal. So there's this negative feedback. So cortisol actually feeds back to both the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus and says, hey, we got the message. We know we're doing stress response now. We're on it. And this negative feedback is really, really important for controlling the system. So you don't just have, okay, wait, we're falling off a cliff, and then forever after you're stressed out. Um, so this is a really, really important system. And it's a very similar system in other axes in the body. Such as? The hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis. So notice, we start with the hypothalamus again. The hypothalamus receives signals. It sends a different stimulating hormone called thyroid-releasing hormone um, to the pituitary gland, which then sends a different hormone, um, in this case it's thyroid-stimulating hormone, to the thyroid gland, which then produces the pro-hormone uh, T4, which is then converted into the active hormone T3 if everything's working properly. The thyroid ham hormones have their metabolic effects in the body, and they also signal back to the brain and say, we got the message that we're supposed to be making thyroid hormone right now. Thank you very much. There's a similar axis again, and you'll notice it starts with hypothalamus um, and pituitary gland. Um, in this case, it ends with the gonads. Um, we're talking about women's health today, so we're going to be talking about ovaries, but this axis is, is uh, comparable in men and, and women um, with some different hormone effects at the end. So... We, um, the hypothalamus in this case produces a gonadotrophin releasing hormone, which signals to the um, pituitary gland to produce luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. These signal to the ovaries to produce estrogen and progesterone. Um, estrogen and progesterone though, here's a little bit of a difference with the HPG axis compared to the HPA and HPT axes. There is both negative feedback and positive feedback from estrogen and progesterone. And the details of exactly why this is and what other factors control whether we've got negative or positive feedback remain unknown. But we know that there's actually neurons in the hypothalamus that um, for some, estrogen and progesterone turn them on, and for some, estrogen and progesterone turn them off. Um, and so this becomes a much more complex system. As soon as you add positive feedback in addition to negative feedback. And it's also very important to be well-regulated. Um, all the regulatory mechanisms still haven't been described, but it's important for it to be well-regulated because this regulates, of course, the menstrual cycle. Now, these axes don't exist in isolation. So, um, you know, you, we understand the hypothalamus is controlling hormones, it's sending signals to the pituitary gland, pituitary gland is like middle management, it sends the signals down, down the road. But these axes are all <laughs> intertwined. And so specifically, I mean, it's no surprise that stress has a bunch of effects. Cortisol um, will, is going to suppress the production of estrogen and progesterone, actually multiple ways. So it inhibits the formation of um, gonadotrophin releasing hormone and luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone while directly suppressing the production of estrogen and progesterone um, at the ovaries. Um, What's a nice complicating factor is if your HPA axis is activated and you're um, producing a lot of cortisol, the body actually uses progesterone as the substrate. So it actually converts progesterone into cortisol. So not only do you get a inhibition of the production of estrogen and progesterone, you use up what progesterone you're forming and this is how we get estrogen dominance from stress. Um, cortisol also inhibits uh, the thyroid gland. It actually inhibits the conversion of T4 to T3 and supports the conversion from T4 to reverse T3, which is a competitive inhibitor for T3. So you get a, the double whammy um, of suppression of the thyroid there. Um, corticotrophin releasing hormone, um, as I talked yesterday, it's not just a one-way signal. It actually has direct effects in tissues. Yesterday I talked about gut health. One of the other things that it does is um, inhibit a thyroid-stimulating hormone, so it suppresses the thyroid again. And so what you'll see is, especially when we're talking about stress, it's not just what's happening with cortisol. 
that is a problem in the human body. It's how these axes um, converge and how they interact. So um, a stress response affects the thyroid and suppresses the thyroid. It also affects the sex um, hormones and suppresses the production of estrogen and progesterone. And the effects from those can further feed back to the HPA axis. So what Sarah's trying to say is that all of these things affect one another. That's all, that's, that's all I've got. Um, <laughs> so we're gonna be reiterating this message, but you know, we've kind of broken down the individual items of each of these axes and what the major components that each is controlling so that you can think about it from the perspective of, okay, HPA controls cortisol and you know, HPT controls thyroid. Um, but ultimately what we're gonna talk about is that none of these things work in a vacuum. They're all working together. And so if one thing is out of whack, it's gonna throw everything out of whack. Okay, yes, yeah, sorry, also. Um, the, what we're gonna then kind of merge into is how the diet affects these things. So we've talked about overall how your body's working, but ultimately what we're all here and interested in is how the foods that you're eating and that are nourishing your body, if they really are, in fact, nourishing your body in a way that produces something positive. So um, specifically, the hormones controlled by HPA, HPG, and HPT are specifically affected by blood sugar regulation. Um, well, they impact those changes, specifically if you change your diet, will impact your blood sugar regulation, your leptin, and your insulin, which we've just shown you has that, that big circular effect of affecting all of your hormones back in that reiteral, re reiterated circular motion. <laughs> what, did, what did I miss? I don't know, go to the next slide. <laughs> um, so to talk a little bit about insulin, one of the things that's really important to understand when we're talking about the effect of insulin on the HPA, HPG, and HPT axes is that there's a happy medium, and then there's an effect when insulin is too low, and there's an effect when insulin is too high. Um, and then there's also an effect when you have insulin resistance, which typically goes along with high insulin, but not necessarily. And so insulin, um, you know, this comes from a normal physiological mechanism to help us access stored energy in between meals um, and to help us know to store energy after, after feeding. But what happens is when you have insulin that is either too high or too low, you activate the HPA axis. And this is, this is it comes from a normal mechanism, but what happens is when we have um, really high insulin from chronic um, overeating, from high carbohydrate diets, um, especially high refined carbohydrate diets, we end up with chronically high insulin, we end up with um, insulin resistance, we also end up with chronic stimulation to the HPA axis as a direct result. Um, it also suppresses the thyroid. So when insulin is either too high or too low, this suppresses the thyroid. Insulin resistance suppresses the thyroid. It also decreases the production of estrogen and progesterone when insulin is too high or too low. So too low is something that happens um, when our uh, metabolisms are not particularly flexible. Um, it also happens in a few um, cases that we're gonna talk about in a little bit more detail in a bit, but it's um, something that can happen with very low carbohydrate diets, can happen with prolonged um, fasting. And um, it's really important to understand that while there may be benefits to um, these types of diet strategies, that in women, we've got direct effects on some really important hormone systems that can have very detrimental effects to our health. Um, leptin is very similar in the sense that um, what we want is the proper levels and the, how levels go up and down with feeding, same as insulin, and we want leptin sensitivity in order to have proper regulation of the HPA, HPG, HPT axes. So when you have leptin that is either too high or too low, or you have leptin resistance, and this is something that can be a direct result from overeating, being obese, um, cr you know, chronically eating very high amounts of refined carbohydrates, but leptin also uh, mediates the adaptation to fasting. So we actually also get leptin resistance um, as a result of chronically under eating. Um, we can get leptin resistance from very low carbohydrate diets, for example. Um, and it's the, the body's response to those types of changes in macronutrient ratios and total um, energy intake. 
So what happens when your leptin is not in the happy medium zone is again, you activate the HPA axis, you suppress the HPT axis, you're suppressing the thyroid, and you suppress the HPG axis, you supp suppress the production of um, estrogen and progesterone, and that has an impact on the human body, especially female body. So, what Sarah's trying to say is, all of these things affect one another. We good? Okay. Yeah. No, no, no. I got it. So, um, some of the things that um, regulate insulin and leptin, I think Sarah talked a little bit about the example of carbohydrates. So, it's not just... Um, whether you eat carbs or not. It's the amount of carbs that you eat, the quality of carbohydrates that you're eating, and whether you're eating them with other macronutrients or micronutrients is also going to affect um, how your body handles them. Um, it's going to regulate all those axes that she's talking about and get your hormones in check if you're living in kind of that happy medium state. But if something is either too high or too low for what your body needs, it's going to cause dysregulation in one part of what say it with me now, all of those things work together. So um, some of the other things that can affect it are meal timing and size. I think we all have played with the idea of maybe eating, you know, six small meals a day versus three big meals a day. That's going to impact it. We'll go into a little more detail about that. Um, it's also the amount of adipose tissue that someone has coming into it. You know, were you metabolically broken and obese? Um, or are you really lean and fit and you're an athlete? Um, Sarah and I are really big proponents of lifestyle factors as well in terms of how it affects your health, and that's because the research supports that insulin and leptin are directly affected by that lifestyle factor, sleep, activity, stress, um, and then Sarah and I are also big nutrient geeks. We are self-proclaimed nutrivores, so um, we, we are highly encourage everybody to seek out the most nutrient-dense foods that you can possibly eat, high source and, and good quality foods, rich in micronutrients, as well as the macronutrients that we're talking about today. So all of those things combined are going to contribute to healthy, happy hormones. What we're trying to show you today is um, what we believe can help get you happy, healthy. Okay. I, gotta, I picked the wrong thing. There you go. Is that you? No, I think you like already said all that. Awesome. Okay. I didn't even get a laugh. This is a tough crowd. Everybody should like stand up and take a breath. All right. I know it's before lunch. That's the problem. It's before lunch. Low blood sugar. What does that do to people? <laughs> okay. Um, so some of the other um, things that Sarah called all the rage in the paleo movement, or we can say frequently talked about in the paleo movement, um, are intermittent fasting. Um, I think there was a big splash maybe a year and a half ago when it was discovered that there was a, a research paper out that showed that intermittent fasting specifically caused different reactions in women than men, and it was then kind of generally accepted, um, maybe not as generally as we would like, that... Um, the effects of intermittent fasting on women can be different long-term specifically than they are on men. So um, when we talk about intermittent fasting and some of the information that Sarah is going to share, what we want to kind of define and explain for you is that we're basing it on the assumption of what the research paper defined, oh, not paper, papers, who knows, studies, something. She's, I'm sure she's got links to wherever this stuff came from. <laughs> um, that this, the fast is specific to 16 to 24 hour period. We realize a lot of people um, aren't likely fasting for 24 hours in kind of the paleo context, but this is what we can tell you the medical research supports, and that's, that's what we're using. We can kind of suppose that a 10 hour fast, a 12 hour fast, a 14 hour fast likely has the same effects, maybe not as quickly, um, but I think the studies came from specifically families who did like Ramadan and, and people who are fasting for that amount of period of time. Um, so in some cases, people who fast paleo, you know, it's all different. Everybody does it differently. You can have some water, you can have some fat, but specifically um, the, the frequency of, of what that means is that you're just not eating for a while. Yeah. Including while you're asleep. 
is usually definitely included in part of that. <laughs> so it's not 16 hours like starting when you wake up. It's 16 hours starting from the last time you ate. Yeah, and most commonly it's just people are skipping breakfast to simplify it. So, um, okay, so Sarah did this awesome um, poll on just an informal poll. An informal poll. Um, so obviously these aren't you know quantifiable research studies, but from the, the group that we polled that was, you know, kind of unanimous and informal, there were five questions asked um, about intermittent fasting. And I'm not going to go through each of them and all the responses, but what I will point out is that number one basically says, I like intermittent fasting. And then the rest say, um, there's some part of intermittent fasting that doesn't work for me, and I don't like it. And so although right now you look at this and it looks like A says, yeah, intermittent fasting, intermittent fasting is great, it's one third of the group that says that. Two thirds of all the people who answered the poll actually say that it didn't work for them in some capacity or another. So the question is why? Um, you know, we've, we've got these clues from the um, interaction between the HPA and the HPT and the HPG axes, but why does intermittent fasting work much more uniformly well for men than it does for women? And why do we have basically responders and non-responders. And I'm gonna uh, read you a quote from this abstract. Um, this is specifically in studies of Ramadan fasting, so please keep that in mind. It's not people eating a, a strict paleo diet. Um, but it says, however, the chronobiological studies have shown that Ramadan fasting affects the circadian distribution of body temperature, cortisol, melatonin, and glycemia nocturnal sleep, daytime alertness, and psychomotor performance were decreased. So this is the type of effect that is seen most typically in women from intermittent fasting, um, especially um, regular intermittent fasting. It's okay. Um, this is a study um, that was done in rats. I know everybody likes to discount animal studies, but actually we can get a lot of really, really important insight, especially into mechanisms. So, okay, why do women have this potentially quite negative health effect from fasting? Um, so again, I'm gonna read you um, a quote. Significant, significant changes in body weight, blood glucose, estrous cyclicity, and serum estradiol, testosterone, and luteinizing hormone levels indicate the negative role of an intermittent fasting daily regimen on reproduction in these young animals. Leptin plays a mechanistic role in suppressing the hypothalamic, in this case, a hypophysial, but it means the same thing, hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. So it's because, as we, are, as we already mentioned, that leptin um, mediates the body's response to fasting. And especially in the female body, there is a direct interaction between leptin levels and sensitivity and the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. So continuing from the same abstract, together these data suggest that intermittent fasting daily regimen negatively influences reproduction in young animals, yes, in this case rats, due to its adverse effects on complete hypothalamus, hypophysical, gonadal axis, and may explain underlying mechanisms to understand the clinical basis of nutritional infertility. So this comes from the rationale, the, the, the clinical analogy here is um, women who chronically undereat and chronically fast, this, as is typically seen in eating disorders like anorexia, um, are infertile. And it's because of the direct effects of um, fasting on the hypothalamic pituitary a gonadal axis. So what's Sarah trying to say? <laughs> there you go, it's all connected. I don't think they have any questions on this one. <laughs> you wanna talk about ketosis? Uh, okay. No, you're gonna do this one. <laughs> you, can you can tell we totally practice this a bunch. You want me to, okay. So um, like the previous one uh, where we discussed intermittent fasting, the only other really um, dietary supported research that we could find is specific to nutritional ketosis. Um, I think most of that research is done on epileptic patients, um, which is why the research is there to begin with, or we can extrapolate from that a very low carb diet. So um, yeah, look, it's right there. Nutritional starvation for epilepsy. I Look at that. 
Um, ketosis is defined as under 30 grams of carbohydrate a day. Um, a moderate amount of protein, because um, we didn't really talk about it here, but protein affects insulin as well. So what we're really talking about is a very high fat intake. And in a paleo diet, we encourage good quality fats being the makeup of that high fat um, ketogenic diet. Very low carb would be kind of what we could extrapolate, defined as less than 50 grams of carbohydrates a day. Um, and you know, a, a lot of paleo individuals see results or um, it's proposed to produce the results of weight loss, improved energy, um, managing health conditions. Specifically, there is good research to show that it does um, support epilepsy and extended life. So what we're going to talk about is what we see in women in the research. Um, again, this uh, poll that we did, this informal poll, has the results saying, um, A, I've tried ketosis and I love it, I feel great. And then the re rest of the results are, I've tried it and it doesn't work for me in one way or another. Um, and you can see that one third of the group says, I tried it and I like it, and two thirds of the group say, it doesn't really work for me. Specifically, um, the difference between the intermittent fasting one and the ketosis one, interesting for me in the very least, was that there is a much larger margin here in D, which is the significant negative effects that it had on someone's health. And there were a significant number of responses for that versus the other two that are kind of moderate responses. So you could be someone who falls in the one-third, it works well for me, but you could also be someone who falls into the almost one-third, it really didn't work for me at all and it actually wrecked my health. And Sarah's gonna explain why. So um, really one of the limitations with uh, research into ketogenic diets is that they're predominantly done in men. But what we do know is from a lot of the epileptic um, studies um, that there are effects on women that are reason for women to be, at the very least, extremely cautious when um, self-experimenting with a ketogenic diet. Um, in particular, there's been three studies looking at um, epileptic adult um, men and women that then dissected some of the side effects of a ketogenic diet in women. Um, what's really interesting about this is this, these were ketogenic diets with uh, micronutrient supplements, um, very, very similar to what is uh, typically um, recommended now for a variety of health benefits. But what is um, often experienced with women is effects to their sex hormones, which manifests as changes to the menstrual cycle. In one study, 21% of the women lost their periods completely. So that means that a ketogenic diet made them infertile, not permanently infertile, um, and they were able to... Um, Many of them regained fertility with um, the change back to uh, a diet that contained carbohydrates. But that should be a really big red flag. In another study, every single woman, adult woman in the study on a ketogenic diet experienced menstrual irregularities. So every single woman had noticeable changes to their menstrual cycle. And in a third study, again, looking at epileptic patients, 45% of the women had menstrual dys dysfunction and it was the most common side effect reported, uh, constipation being the second most um, uh, highly reported side effect. There's been only one study that um, has looked at the effect of ketogenic diets on the thyroid that I was able to find. It was a short-term study, so we can talk about adaptation to ketogenic diets over time and how that may change the effect. But what's really important to understand is, at least in the short-term study, that a ketogenic diet caused a significant fall in the active hormone T3. Um, it supported conversion of T4 to reverse T3. Um, and that dramatically impacts uh, thyroid function and metabolism. Um, so I want to read- This is the problem with two people. Right. <laughs> So um, this is another study looking at um, ketogenic diets, um, again, in animals. And we can all you know, obviously take it with a grain of salt. But this, I think, was really, really interesting because it really brings back the importance of um, diet and um, sexual function and sexual health in women. Um, so they put um, these animals on a ketogenic diet. And uh, I'm going to quote this because it's um, quite um, amazing. 
A gestational ketogenic diet deleteriously affects maternal fertility and increases susceptibility to fetal ketoacidosis during lactation. So not only was there effect during pregnancy, but also after the mice babies were born. What are mice babies called? Mice pups, I think they're called pups. Um, prenatal and early postnatal exposure to a ketogenic diet also results in significant alterations to neonatal brain structure and results in retarded physiological growth. So I don't think there's anybody out there who is recommending that a pregnant um, or lactating woman um, attempt a ketogenic diet, but this should be, if, if anybody is out there, if you hear of anybody suggesting that this might be a good idea, while this is an animal study, it is a really big red flag saying that this may not only be dangerous to the mother, but dangerous to the baby. Okay, so I know you've got this one. What I want to kind of drive home, in case you didn't actually get that they're all affecting each other, is that um, what I hear very often from women who lose their period or have irregular menstruation is that, well, I'm going to try and have a baby, so it's not a big deal. But what we're trying to show you here is that it is a really big deal because that is a flag that you can see in your body right away that tells you that something isn't right. So if your menstruation becomes irregular, that means because all of this works together, that all of this is becoming irregular and broken. So when we talk about infertility and irregular menstruation, if you are a woman or if you know a woman who has these problems, it is the utmost importance to figure out what is the driver behind that problem and how can you fix what the driver is so that the symptoms of the menstruation can change. Please change the slides. I am? I, well, I, oh, you did. I just did. Don't touch it, Sarah. Wait. I'm not touching it. Yeah, so that's the next one. You got it. Okay. Go nuts. No, I'm going to go nuts. I'm going to stand here. Oh. There you go. I'll stand here. Look pretty for everybody, Sarah. Okay, so w what is the solution that we recommend? Um, it's really dependent on who you are, what your activity level is, what your health is. We can't prescribe a result and a specific diet for everybody. I know that's what everybody wants to hear, but it really is about what you do and what your health is. So ultimately what you're looking to do is to keep your blood sugar regulated um, so that you can manage and regulate your insulin sensitivity, your leptin sensitivity. You want all that in check. So moderate carbohydrate what, what we're recommending and, and seeing in the research to support is 75 to 300 grams a day, depending on your activity level, your health, your goals, if you're a woman, could put you in that sweet spot to where you're going to try to find your, your ideal health that would affect that overall circle. Sarah and I also highly recommend nutrient density. Um, we both love the hashtag more vegetables than a vegetarian, not just because it's punny, because it is, but because vegetables are really important to health. There's science that indicates if you only eat a red meat diet, you're more likely to have cancer, right? There you go, see, scientists nodded. So um, if you are eating a lot of green vegetables specifically, but vegetables entirely, that actually regulates and helps your body recover from that and have health and, and longevity, longevity benefits. Um, we would recommend that if you are eating meat that you would do so from pasture-raised animals so that you're getting a higher nutrient density in the meat that you are eating. Um, specifically grass-fed beef, if you're not aware, has an extremely high amount of omega-3s and chicken, no matter if it's pastured or not, has a high amount of omega-6. So we support ruminant animals as being the majority of what it is that you consume. And seafood. And so, yeah, sorry, and bone broth and organ meats. Um, <laughs> we're we're kind of weird about that stuff. Okay, so adequate protein um, intake is really important. Um, it's going to help regulate that leptin and insulin, but. Um, just in general, eating protein, specifically in the morning, has been shown to have improved effects on, on weight loss for women, if that's what you're looking for. If not, it's just still good to eat protein. Um, so there you go. Eat, eat a high-protein breakfast, and that helps regulate those hormones. Um, regular, spa regular spacing of your meals is one of those things we, kind of we touched on earlier with the intermittent fasting. So if you're aiming for you know, two to three larger meals per day, um, maybe a snack versus, you know, one really big meal or skipping breakfast, you're going to see regulation of hormones that will help um, it go up when it needs to go up and down when it needs to go down so that your body will stay level if you're eating the right macronutrients as well. 
um, and activity, specifically weight-bearing activity, resistance training, not chronic cardio, because that's where you're going to see that HPA axis spike up in a way that you don't really want from a cortisol reaction. Um, so weight-bearing activity and strength training um, can really help with that regulation as well. And um, last but not least, sleep and stress management. I think they go hand in hand. I always feel better when I'm sleeping. I had a terrible day yesterday. I didn't sleep for 22, to, 22 hours straight and I was quite stressed, but I uh, got some sleep tonight and I feel better. So um, if you can make the time to do that, it will help your health, period. There's just no lack of research to support that. Um, and figuring out ways to reduce the stress in your own life. So whether that be walking or yoga or whatever you find um, helps relax you. And um, I can let Sarah talk a little more about the self-experimentation, um, but ultimately what, what we would recommend is that if you are going to try to decrease or increase your carbohydrates if you've been doing something for a long time, your body will do best to adapt with gradual changes. So not just dump, jumping right into an intermittent fasting or not just jumping right into ketogenic, but kind of you know five carbohydrates a day, reduce it down and see how you feel. And there might be a period where you hit you know 25 grams reduced makes you feel really great, but you know 50 grams reduced makes you feel bad. And you would feel that in your own body if you did it gradually where that sweet spot might be. Um, so when it comes to choosing carbohydrates with the goal of regulating leptin and insulin, with the goal of then regulating the HPA axes, the HPT axes, and the HPG axes, um, not all carbohydrates are created equal. Um, generally, women respond better to slow burn carbohydrates. So these are the starchy vegetables, um, just because that helps to regulate blood sugar very well. And that's not true across the board. Um, fruit is still typically a low to moderate glycemic load food. Um, but, um, but when if you're experimenting with your carbohydrate intake with the goal of, well, with any goal, with any health-related goal, but knowing that you need to regulate these important hormones, um, that is a really, really good place to start. It's also much easier to regulate your blood sugar when you're eating carbohydrates um, at the same time as you're eating other macronutrients, protein, fat, fiber. Um, so when you are um, experimenting with carbohydrate intake, you can also experiment with the timing of your carbohydrate intake. So one of the really neat things is, because there are some health benefits to very low carbohydrate diet, there are some health benefits um, to that higher fat intake, um, and what happens in women's bodies especially is that the negative impact is seen after a couple of days. So there's a couple of strategies that you can experiment with um, that may help actually avoid the negative impact while still allowing you to have some of the benefits of intermittent fasting or, or um, a ketogenic diet approach that is carb backloading where you stay very low carbohydrate through, through breakfast and lunch and in the evening you consume the majority of your day's carbohydrates. Um, sometimes you consume those carbohydrates only on days that you are highly active and on days that you are less active you would maybe stay very low carbohydrate for the entire day. Um, carb cycling is very, very similar in the sense you have some days that are lower carb and some days um, that are higher carbohydrate. So if you'd like to avoid vaginal dryness, <laughs> right? There they laugh. Vaginal dryness, that's what you wanted to hear about. OK. If you don't want this stuff, what should you do? <gasps> Come on. I know you know it. It all works together, right? OK. Any questions? <laughs> That's like the most delayed applause ever. It was awkward ending, that's all. You go ahead. I think they want you to move to the mic. If you have a question, move to the mic so we can hear you, please. Hi, I'm just wondering how this fits into the ancestral health framework, because um, it does make sense to me that, you know, carb backloading, cycling, all this, you know, manipulation of carbohydrate. I mean, in the old days, people didn't walk around with a glucose strip, right? And so how did that work? So when you look at um, ancestral diets, you look at hunter-gatherer populations, um, a ketogenic diet is not actually a very typical example of what they were eating. So um, while they were typically sort of lowish to moderate carbohydrate, mm -hmm. ketogenic diet was not necessarily seen, certainly um, 
certainly not for the extended or prolonged periods of time that many people are experimenting with this. Mm -hmm. One example, though, of where we do see these very high fat intake diets is in the Inuit. Mm -hmm. um, and the Inuit um, actually had sort of chronic infertility. So what would happen is seasonally, smaller animals would be available. Mm -hmm. um, they were eating the entire part of the animal, and one of the things that the women were eating was the thyroid gland. Mm -hmm. There would then be a baby boom nine months later. So what was happening was that the, the um, were very likely happening was the high fat, low carbohydrate diet was suppressing their thyroid glands, which was suppressing their um, uh, sex hormone production. Mm -hmm. So they were actually infertile until they had a feed of thyroid gland, which is basically everything that you need in order to make, um, uh, make thyroid hormones. It's kind of like a, mm -hmm. it's a great little sort of hack if you are going to do this, to just find some good thyroid gland and you can um, help your body make those hormones. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that from an ancestral perspective, we can actually point to this type of um, direct impact on sex hormones happening in hunter-gatherer or, or um, hunter-gatherer sort of horticulturist populations. When you look at the majority of the populations that have been studied, they have much higher carbohydrate mm -hmm. intake. Um, and then we don't see these types of effects on fertility. Mm -hmm. Right, thank you very much. This is a great talk. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Oh, are we going back and forth? Or? Sure. Hi. Sarah, that was amazing. Stacy, amazing. Um, this it is was what, really all Sarah. You could have just left it at that. It's fine. <laughs> this is what paleo women should be doing. Uh, I am a keto nutritionist, and I have a few, just a few things. I don't want any woman to think that vaginal dryness or infertility should stop her from doing a ketogenic diet if she has cancer. And I really do think the rules change for people who have cancer. And... Um, and I, I want to bring up one thing you, you did say, and I want everybody to really zero in on the Ramadan fasting studies were done with women who were not uh, ketogenic. They were following standard diets. So the adaptation period is not, I mean, it's just four weeks. So a lot of these things that happen, the infertility, the, um, it, it, the, the uh, losing your period, those things happen, I believe, as a result of the caloric restriction um, rather than the fact that they go ketogenic. Because I don't see these kinds of things in the people that I work with. So I think if it's a well-planned ketogenic diet, I really don't want women to be afraid to do it if they have cancer. Thank you. Um, you know, there's definitely health conditions in the medical literature in which a ketogenic diet has been shown to be an extremely powerful therapeutic tool. And I wouldn't want a woman to, uh, um, to miss out on the opportunity to use such a powerful therapeutic tool for fear of these side effects. It's going to be a cost-benefit analysis for each woman. But I do want to point out that the epilepsy studies were in isocaloric diets. So that was um, menstrual dysfunction in, without the calorie restriction. I, I have... I'm, I have two questions, but I can say them really quickly. Uh, just, just one oh, really? Yeah. <sighs> Pick your favorite. Okay, I'll, I'll ask the one about, um, as somebody who no longer has to worry about fertility, anything in your research about um, the effects on postmenopausal women um, of ketogenic or intermittent fasting? As far as I'm aware, it has not been studied. I did I actually saw a study for the talk that I'm doing later this afternoon in postmenopausal women talking about the benefits of strength training for women uh, postmenopausal in terms of hormone regulation and um, that sort of thing. So there, I can at least point to that, but not ketogenic specifically. Let's have another big hand for Sarah and Stacey. 